Well, the recent film uh, For Greater Glory uh, deals with the period in Mexican history in the 1920s when um, a very oppressive government uh, moved aggressively against uh, the Catholic faith. The uh, president was a man named Plutarco Elias Calles, and he enforced laws that were actually embedded in the Mexican Constitution of 1917. And what he did was he banned uh, religious ceremonies, so mass and baptism, confirmation, weddings. Uh, bishops were mostly uh, exiled from the country. Priests and nuns were disallowed from wearing uh, religious habits. It was a very aggressive attack on uh, religion. Priests that uh, resisted and people that resisted were um, tortured, imprisoned, in some cases uh, killed outright. One of the most uh, moving and, and frankly shocking scenes in the movie is the death of uh, an old priest played by the great Peter O'Toole. And um, the federales have come you know, to enforce the law. And this Father Christopher, um, instead of resisting or running away, um, sits in church in his mass vestments. And um, the soldiers come and they take him out of church, line him up against the wall, and they shoot him. And that's a, a real life event. That's a uh, depiction of, um, of a brutal execution that really happened in the early days of this uh, period. Well, people like uh, Father Christopher tried to resist in that nonviolent way. Others, too. There was a famous um, a newspaper editor. He's played by uh, Eduardo Verastegui in this movie. And uh, he's trying through his speeches and through his newspaper articles to resist this movement in a uh, nonviolent way. He, too, is, is put to death. Now, given the intensity of this persecution, it was almost inevitable that a, an armed rebellion would emerge. And indeed, it does. And this is the Cristero uh, Rebellion which began as largely kind of disorganized bands of, of guerrilla warriors, but then is organized into a rather efficient fighting force by a general who's played by Andy Garcia in the movie. And so the bulk of the movie is about the emergence of this Cristero army under the leadership of, uh, of this general. Um, you might say the emotional heart of the movie is a relationship between the general and this kid, Jose, a 12-year-old, who had seen the execution of Father Christopher. He had witnessed that. He was a friend of the old priest, and he saw him put to death. So he joins the Cristero movement and serves as a kind of you know, aide-de-camp and, and um, uh, standard-bearer for the army. Well, little Jose is uh, captured in an uh, intense battle, and he's uh, taken away, and he's tortured. They're trying to get information out of him. They're trying to, to um, uh, cow him into submission. And they keep saying, just renounce you know, the faith. Just uh, affirm your belief in the federal government and so on torture him, etc. Um, and at the climactic moment, uh, he resists them and he expresses the great motto of the Cristero movement, which was, Viva el Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. And with that, they, they put him to death, this 12-year-old kid. At the very end of the movie, there's a, a very brief um, uh, reconstruction of the death of Padre Pro, you know, the famous uh, Father Miguel Pro, who was killed during the same period, with that uh, phrase on his lips. It's the first martyrdom ever in, in the history of the church to be photographed because people smuggled cameras in. And there's Padre Pro who puts his arms out in the sign of the cross. And as the, um, as the guns are fired, he shouts, Viva el Cristo Rey. And so that phrase you hear throughout the movie on the lips of, of dozens of characters. And what struck me as I watched it was uh, the power, really, of that phrase, Viva el Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. If N.T. Wright, the great uh, biblical scholar, is correct, that's the central teaching of Christianity. Wright says the Gospels tell the story of how Yahweh, the God of Israel, in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, became king. Now look back at the, at the Old Testament and you see lots of examples of bad kingship. From Adam himself, by the way, who's seen as kind of a bad king in the way that he mismanages uh, the garden, but then come up through the Pharaoh into the Amalekites and the, and the Philistines and the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans, the Bible presents a whole series of bad kings, which is to say people who govern improperly through cruelty and through hatred and through violence and through separation and all of the usual tactics that we see on clear display in a lot of rulers uh, to the present day. But throughout the Bible, you hear like a refrain, I myself will come, Yahweh says through the prophets and the psalmist, for example. I myself will come and shepherd this people. I myself 
will be the king of Israel. And once they see my kingship in Israel, I will attract the whole world, and the whole world will come under the lordship of God. If N.T. Wright is right, that's the central theme of uh, the Old Testament. Now, what do you hear on the lips of Jesus as he first emerges as a, a public preacher? The kingdom of God is at hand. See, there it is. There's the Old Testament hope that the kings of the world will come to judgment and they'll be supplanted by Yahweh who will be the true king of Israel and therefore the king of the whole world. That's what he says. The kingdom, the reign of God is at hand. Now watch him. What's he doing? He's showing the means by which Yahweh becomes king. Jesus in his nonviolence, in his open table fellowship, in his outreach to saint and sinner, to Pharisee and tax collector, Jesus who um, offers forgiveness, healing, love, compassion in all directions. What is that but the reign of Yahweh made flesh, the incarnation of the kingship of God? Now, keep the story going. And here's where you see echoes of the, of the Cristero film. What does that awaken? Delight, yes, for many, the thrill that Yahweh is becoming king, but also necessarily the opposition of the kingdoms of the world. Watch that theme now all through the New Testament. The kingdoms of the world, based upon hatred, cruelty, violence, etc., don't like this new form of life, this new kingship, and so they oppose Jesus. It comes to his climax, of course, on the cross, which was an instrument of Roman uh, torture. It was state-sponsored terrorism, as I've often said. All the powers of the world, cruelty, hatred, violence, corruption, institutional injustice, I mean, all of it comes at him. It's the battle of two kingdoms. Jesus allows it to wash over him. He doesn't battle it on its own terms. He doesn't battle it with violence. He takes it upon himself is overwhelmed by it. But then, in this delicious trick, if you want, that's the way the church fathers saw it, God's love swallows up all the darkness of the world. In the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, he shows the victory of God over all the powers of the world. Which is why, of course, Pontius Pilate, in a delicious irony, puts over the cross of Jesus, Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And of course he put it in, in Greek and in Hebrew as well, so nobody could miss it. But see, no one in the first century would have missed, no Jew would have missed the import of that sign. If that's the king of the Jews, then he's the king of the world. Then he is Yahweh coming to rule over his people. And that's exactly the message of the first great Christian evangelist. That's Paul's message. You've got a new king, Jesus Curios. Jesus Christ is Lord. And they face down, as Jesus himself did, the opposition of the world. Look at all the first Christians. Almost all of them were imprisoned, tortured, persecuted, killed. So it goes, so it goes. But the message of the church is there's a new king, there's a new way of ordering, and the kings of the world, the tyrants of the world, do not have the final word. In fact, they are swallowed up by the light of God's love. There's the church's message that goes out up and down the centuries. Now, just a last thought. I would never for a second question the motives of those who took up arms in the Cristero uprising. I understand it. I wouldn't question their motives. But the church has canonized and beatified, not the soldiers in that war, but those who, through nonviolence, resisted. Little Jose himself, that's a, a real-life story. He's been beatified. The... Um, writer and speaker played by uh, Verastegui, he's been beatified. Uh, the church has recognized that the best way to battle the powers of the world is not on, on their terms, but rather with the power of the cross. We announce the kingship of Jesus, who has swallowed up the violence of the world in the great nonviolent compassion of God. And that's why Viva el Cristo Rey has been our message from the beginning. Thank you.